St. Joseph's Medical Center, and today I'll be joined by Scott Neely, our Vice President and Chief Medical Officer. So he's the he's the talent of the of the Don and uh, Scott show, and I'm simply the uh, the good looking one. Um, I want to welcome all of you to uh, our community update. It's our hope that uh, when it comes to getting information about COVID or about healthcare in general, that you'll look to St. Joseph's. Uh, as one of the options for you. And uh, we're looking forward to presenting some information about uh, what's going on uh, both in our county here and nationally. So Natalie, thank you. Here's what we're gonna cover. Um, I'm gonna focus primarily on the hospital's recent experience uh, in San Joaquin County and Scott will focus more on a national uh, more scientifically oriented and vaccine update. And then we should have time for question and answer. So thank you very much for all joining us. So this is our dashboard here at St. Joseph's Medical Center. Very busy slide, uh, but I'll just, uh, I'll walk around it with you. Uh, during the month of August so far, we have had 56 admissions and six expirations. And so, uh, we're a little busier in August than we were in July, and I'll show you some information about that countywide. Uh, we've had six expirations so far this month, but if you go back and look at the previous uh, 12 months, uh, it doesn't show the, the surge that occurred last July, but it does show the surge that occurred in December and how truly overwhelming that was for our community, both in the number of patients hospitalized here at St. Joseph's and in our county, and the number of people who passed away. At the top right is a total tally uh, that says we've had a total of 2,750 cases as of yesterday and 596 mortalities as of yesterday with about 21.7% mortality of patients who are hospitalized. Uh, and our current census right in the middle of the top of the page there as of yesterday, 59 inpatients uh, with COVID, 22 of those in the ICU, uh, and, uh, and one recovered patient. Those numbers are a little different today, but that's close enough. Uh, the other thing I would draw your attention to, stay there, Natalie. Thank you. Go back. Thank you. Uh, is on the bottom left of the graphic. That shows the age distribution for the pandemic up until the end of June. So basically, 15 or 16 months. Uh, and then from July uh, 1st to current uh, by age distribution. And I'll just have you focus on the age 41 to 50, 31 to 40, 18 to 30. And what you see there is a significant change in terms of much younger patients requiring hospitalization as a percentage of patients admitted to the hospital. So in the first part of the pandemic, primarily older people, although we did have younger patients, uh, and now as uh, more older people have been vaccinated, uh, more institutionalized older people being vaccinated, uh, you can see that the admission uh, activity is in a, a, a lower uh, age group. So a majority of the patients 50 and under, about 57% page down. Next page, thank you. So this is countywide. Uh, almost 80,000 patients have been confirmed positive th throughout the county. Uh, there have been 1,491 deaths. So St. Joseph's has had about 40% of the cases and a similar percentage of the mortalities. Next slide. This just shows the, the daily case rate uh, on the right-hand side. And so you can see that uh, Lodi, Stockton, and Tracy kind of lead in terms of cases per 10,000. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this very much. And you can also see the total cases on the left-hand side and the new cases. If we were still using tiers, right? We used to be, you know, we had the, the uh, substantial tier, which was the red tier. Uh, we would be in that tier now. And so even though the state's no longer using that, we can still do the math on that we would be in red, we would be restricting visitation to the hospital, uh, and so on and so forth. Next slide. This is countywide data about hospitalization 
uh, overall hospitalization and also uh, specific to COVID. So you can see that uh, right now we're at 114% of our ICU capacity countywide, led by San Joaquin General and St. Joe's. Uh, the two largest ICUs by far in the county uh, have more than 100% census. The county had 150% of their bed census. Um, also the overall census for the hospitals, 801. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see that uh, D Dameron with 58 patients, 202 beds, uh, operating about 100 of those beds has a, a lower uh, overall uh, census and bed capacity availability compared to St. Joe's with 308 uh, and uh, essentially holding patients in the emergency department. 176 COVID patients. You can see the distribution uh, really uh, more centrally located uh, in Lodi and Stockton between San Joaquin County and us. Uh, the number of COVID uh, patients in the ICU, 46, uh, and the number of those patients on ventilators uh, says here 22. So that gives you a, a, a pretty good sense of how COVID is impacting the hospitals and the hospital's overall volume. Up above here, uh, increased 23% from a week ago. So that's a pretty substantial increase uh, from our uh, 140 or so we had a week ago. Next slide. I like this slide because it has the previous two surges. Uh, at the bottom in blue is just the number of hospitalized COVID patients. We just focus on that. Uh, you can see that the rise in COVID cases we're seeing now looks familiar uh, to the previous two rises. We hope that it will not have the same kind of peak, but uh, the projections are that we're probably in for another at least month and a half to two months of increasing cases. That's the prediction. And uh, we, uh, we won't know how it turns out because we've been wrong about most everything uh, until it turns out. Next slide. And this just shows you more granularly that same slide uh, just for the last month. So we had less than 40 patients in the hospital on July 1st. Uh, and now you can see the, the increase that we've had up to our 174. Next slide. We have public health orders. CDPH is the California Department of Public Health. They uh, write regulations for hospitals and, and public health. Uh, and they are um, now mandating that all healthcare workers in acute settings must be fully vaccinated by September 30th. Now, I will tell you that prior to them issuing that order, Adventist Health, Kaiser Permanente, UC System, and Sutter all already had made a decision that they would uh, require their employees to be fully vaccinated. Uh, and today, Common Spirit Health announced the same thing for their employees in 22 states. Uh, so uh, that is uh, getting to be uh, the most popular uh, order, and that is for that uh, employees and physicians and contractors and others who come to our hospital will have to be uh, fully vaccinated. Now, um, it also says that visitors must show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test within 72 hours. Given the rise in COVID cases, we believe that um, our county and all of our hospitals will close to most visitors uh, tomorrow. And so this won't be as much of an impact uh, from an administrative standpoint. We will still allow the exception for visitation, uh, but we don't know whether or not we'll have exceptions to the testing for those exceptions. Those include uh, a, a birth coach or a significant other of a woman having a baby, a child who needs a parent uh, with the child being hospitalized, uh, an adult patient who needs an advocate that is incapable of, of uh, acting for themselves and an advocate actually uh, helps the care uh, and um, also in end of life situations. But we will limit visitation significantly until the pandemic starts going the other way. Next slide. I'm gonna just give you a few things that are not COVID related. So uh, we're, we uh, uh, nationally recognized as a LeapFrog A hospital. Now four times in a row, that's two years of data. That's the first time uh, 
we've ever had that kind of a streak and we're very proud of it. These are uh, really more current measures than most of the other quality boards you can go look at. And we think more meaningful measures. Uh, and so uh, for us to become an A hospital, that's really terrific. There's no other A hospital in our county uh, who is consistently getting those scores. Uh, 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 we are uh, uh, platinum for our chest pain and MI performance. That means heart attack. Uh, and uh, we are three stars, which is the highest rating you can get for cardiac surgery related to bypass surgery, meaning the most common open heart surgery. Uh, and actually, uh, we've had that three out of three rating in two out of the last three years, which makes us probably the top three hospitals in the state of California. Uh, in terms of uh, risk-adjusted measurable outcomes, this is a gold standard for uh, outcomes in, in cardiovascular surgery. And then Cal California Hospital Compare, which is a, a state uh, compare of administrative data, uh, puts us on the honor roll for these areas. And again, patient safety being one of the things that we're really focused on. I'm sure Dr. Neely will end his presentation with a safety slide. If he isn't, he's probably going to work on that real quick, putting it together. And then finally, we've uh, finished our, our 300th TAVR case. Uh, so TAVR surgery, as I, I know I've described to you before, is basically uh, replacing the aortic valve in the heart uh, while the uh, minimally invasively, and while the patient is not under general anesthesia and without any you know, incision uh, of any kind. It's a puncture wound like having a, an angiogram uh, and we deploy a, 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 a valve and usually those patients are staying 24 to 36 hours in the hospital and going home without a major insult of surgery. So it's a really terrific procedure and we're very proud of the work that we're doing in that area. Next slide. The, sorry. Next, the, the other thing we're really proud of, uh, this is Dr. Neely's new residents as of July 1st. This is just the residents showing up on July 1 for their first year of residency here at St. Joseph's. Uh, we now have 95 total residents. This is about half of those uh, showing up for their first year of residency in these six plus general surgery programs, emergency medicine, family medicine, internal medicine, transitional year, psychiatry and anesthesia. And then uh, we uh, help the San Joaquin General Program train about 20% of their surgeons are here at any given time uh, for their five-year program that has five residents in each year. We are working on the applications for four new programs, urology, orthopedics, uh, interventional radiology, not OBGYN, sorry, uh, and neurology. And uh, we expect to uh, be able to announce to you sometime next year uh, whether we're going to be successful in standing those programs up in July of 2022. Next slide. And then finally, uh, this is our first graduating class of our cohort of 22 uh, nursing students who were employees of hospitals in the county. All of these people work for one of the hospitals in the county. In this case, 10 of the 12 actually are from St. Joseph's. There's another uh, cohort that uh, did their rotations at Adventist Health in Lodi, and, and uh, we took uh, these employees and uh, we're giving them quite a future uh, as nurses, uh, we hope, working here at St. Joseph's. But we're very proud of this program. We, uh, we got the help from Delta College to be able to expand their nursing program by uh, the spots necessary for these students to be able to be guaranteed a spot uh, based on their prerequisites and their grade point average. Next slide. Now I'd like to turn it over to Scott Neely, our chief medical officer. And, uh, and I, I know that uh, it's gonna do a great job telling us about what's going on more nationally and as it relates to the science. Thank you all for letting me present. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Don, I'm Scott Neely and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at St. Joe's. Uh, I'm a pulmonary and critical care specialist. Uh, I've been practicing medicine for uh, over 33 years, and uh, prior to becoming a, a, a healthcare administrator, I, I practiced full-time uh, as a specialist in the ICU, taking care uh, of the most critically ill patients. 
and so were I still working full time, I'd be with my colleagues uh, in the ICU right now, uh, taking care uh, of those in our community who uh, need us the most. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today uh, about the COVID vaccine and also the impact that the Delta variant is having on us here, uh, both nationally and in the county. Uh, let's go to the first slide. This is just sort of a high-level overview of uh, important points I want to touch on today. Um, right now in this country, uh, we've administered over 346 million vaccine doses, uh, uh, and that's data as of August 2nd, 2021. Uh, that, uh, that volume of vaccine doses uh, is in and of itself uh, a tremendous resource uh, to help us understand uh, both the safety of the vaccine as well as the impact uh, that it has on uh, people uh, as to whether they're able to avoid infection uh, with COVID uh, and what happens to them if they uh, have a breakthrough infection. Uh, the thing that we know both from the uh, clinical studies that uh, allowed us to implement the vaccines as well as from those 346 million doses that have already been administered is that the vaccine is, is extraordinarily safe and that serious adverse events uh, as a result of the vaccine uh, are extremely rare. And by extremely rare, I mean uh, a few events out of a million vaccine doses. Vaccination substantially lowers the risk of COVID-19 infection uh, and uh, it is a powerful protector against the development of severe disease uh, with its long-term sequelae, such as long COVID syndrome, uh, as well as death. Now, breakthrough infection and infection in children is actually becoming uh, more common now uh, with the Delta variant, but vaccination continues uh, to be very effective at preventing against severe disease requiring hospitalization and vaccination continues to be very effective uh, at preventing death, uh, even though the new Delta variant is a far more deadly and uh, more infectious foe uh, than the original Alpha variant. Let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna show you some data nationally, which I think is very interesting. Uh, this uh, map of the United States uh, uh, showed uh, the status of the United States in terms of vaccine hotspots uh, as of uh, two days ago. Uh, as you can see, there are a few isolated hotspots uh, in the western uh, part of the United States. Most of the uh, vaccine hotspots in the west are in uh, relatively rural areas. Uh, uh, San Joaquin County is kind of uh, in the middle of the pack right there. Uh, we have a higher uh, incidence of disease right now uh, than uh, uh, more populous areas uh, uh, like the Bay Area and Southern California, but we don't have as high of an incidence disease uh, as you see, particularly uh, in the southeastern United States, uh, where uh, some of the very dark uh, maroon counties that you can see there uh, have uh, uh, over 150 uh, new cases of COVID-19 uh, per 100,000 population per day. Uh, it's an extraordinary rate of infection occurring in some of those places. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact uh, on the healthcare system in those communities. Next slide, please. What I hope you can see from this slide is that it's virtually a photographic negative, the one that I just showed you. Uh, uh, dark areas in this slide represent areas where uh, uh, the communities have had uh, a high percentage of people vaccinated <clears throat> and light areas represent areas where vaccination rates are very low. Uh, and what this uh, map uh, and the previous one I think show uh, more graphically than any other demonstration uh, is that uh, where vaccine rates are low, uh, disease rates are extremely high right now and vice versa. Next slide, please. And here's a little bit of tabular data showing uh, uh, where uh, certain states are in the United States in terms uh, of their 14-day change 
uh, and uh, number of cases per 100,000 population. And over on the far right, the percentage of their patients who are fully vaccinated. And as you can see, the hardest hit states in the United States uh, have vaccine rates under 40%. Uh, uh, you can see California, which was number 16 um, in terms of new cases per 100,000 population. Uh, uh, the entire state is at 53%, but we're a very heterogeneous state. Um, uh, with uh, certain parts of our state having very high vaccination rates uh, and other areas uh, having lower rates. San Joaquin County uh, uh, has a lower vaccination rate, uh, and, and I think the next slide gives us a little more information about that. So uh, these are vaccination rates uh, in uh, uh, various jurisdictions in, in San Joaquin County. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, we've got a pretty heterogeneous rate right now. Uh, these are vaccinations uh, in uh, uh, people who are uh, candidates for vaccination, in other words, over the age of 12. Uh, and we've got some areas that are fairly high, like Tracy, uh, other areas uh, uh, where the vaccination rates are quite low. That tends to be in our more rural areas. And we're just under 50% for the county. Next slide, please. Uh, back up, please, Natalie. And here you can see, again, uh, where San Joaquin County sits, kind of in the middle uh, in terms of vaccination rates, and we're kind of in the middle uh, in terms of COVID infection rates uh, as well. Next slide, please. One of the things uh, that we are seeing in the county that is quite concerning uh, is that uh, there is a mismatch between vaccination rates uh, and susceptibility to severe disease. Uh, uh, this uh, particular data divides members of our population uh, into uh, less healthy and more healthy quartiles. Quartile one being the largest portion uh, uh, of the uh, citizens of our county uh, uh, and also uh, the folks who have the most risk factors uh, for severe disease, those being people with high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, obesity. Um, those folks who are at highest risk for the disease actually have the lowest vaccination rate. Uh, and that is tr uh, certainly a, a tremendous concern for us. Uh, and we can see the results of this particular fact here in our hospital. Uh, because our most severely ill patients right now are all unvaccinated, and they are all people who have uh, these risk factors, uh, such as, for example, uh, diabetes or underlying cardiac disease. The vaccination rates uh, for our more healthy citizens are actually uh, pretty good, 68.7% uh, for quartile four, uh, but those are the people who are actually the healthiest members of our community and at the lowest risk uh, for severe um, uh, outcomes from the disease. So uh, this uh, example of you know, what we might call health inequity uh, is a, a, an important reminder uh, as to why we are at a very high risk uh, for having a lot of bad outcomes right now due to the uh, resurgence uh, of the virus and the emergence of the Delta virus. Next slide, please. So uh, what is different about the Delta virus? <clears throat> uh, it seems uh, to be uh, a significantly more effective uh, infectious agent uh, when compared to the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. What this uh, graph shows uh, is uh, the uh, infectious uh, efficacy uh, of a virus on the uh, horizontal axis. So uh, uh, being farther to the right means it spreads faster. Being farther to the left means it spreads less fast. Uh, and you can see that the original SARS-CoV-2 strain was, was quite infectious, more infectious than seasonal flu or the common cold. Uh, but uh, sort of in the same ballpark as uh, the original SARS virus uh, and uh, agents like 
uh, MERS and smallpox. The new variant is far more infectious than the original variant. Uh, uh, it may be uh, up to a thousand times uh, uh, more infectious than the original variant. Uh, it's in the same ballpark as chickenpox, which is a virus that is also spread uh, through the respiratory system. The other uh, aspect of the new uh, Delta variant uh, that is different from the ancestral uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, version of the virus is that it may be more deadly as well. Uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult to tease this information out because uh, uh, currently, uh, as uh, Mr. Wiley already noted, uh, the population being infected with the Delta variant is younger and, and perhaps less susceptible uh, to uh, uh, poor outcomes uh, than uh, our, our first populations of patients who were infected. But it seems to be uh, a very, very uh, deadly disease. Uh, and one of the things that we're noticing about the new Delta variant uh, is that it is uh, infecting a lot more children, uh, and it is causing more se severe disease in children. Uh, and that is a, a, obviously a huge concern right now uh, as we head back into school season. Next slide, please. So, so this shows the impact of vaccination uh, on your own outcome uh, with regards to COVID-19. Um, in terms of uh, just simple uh, disease incidents, uh, there is a very substantial reduction uh, in getting the disease at all uh, if you have been vaccinated. Now, Delta is having an impact on that because people uh, who have been fully vaccinated uh, clearly can become infected with the Delta variant. Uh, but uh, uh, perhaps even more importantly uh, than the reduction in disease uh, incidents is the fact that vaccination uh, provides very powerful protection uh, against uh, severe disease, uh, uh, disease that is severe enough uh, to cause hospitalization. That's the middle gra graph. There is a 25-fold reduction in the risk of hospitalization uh, should you get COVID-19 if you've been vaccinated. There is a 25-fold reduction in your risk of dying of COVID should you be vaccinated. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, is the most important reason uh, for getting a vaccine uh, in terms of you personally and your own personal risk. Uh, two big reasons to get a vaccine. Number one, uh, uh, it helps us to all be safe together uh, when we reduce uh, the risk of spread uh, as a group we're all safer. And then the second big reason is it prevents you individually from becoming severely ill and perhaps dying. Next slide, please. Here is some data looking at the vaccine effectiveness uh, for uh, the alpha, the original uh, viral variant versus Delta. Uh, and as you can see in this data uh, that was published recently, um, there has been a drop off uh, in protection against uh, becoming infected uh, uh, for people who have been fully vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. However, the uh, very substantial protection against hospitalization or death uh, is maintained uh, for the Pfizer, to, Pfizer vaccine uh, uh, in patients who've uh, been infected with the Delta virus. And this, uh, uh, this uh, aspect of uh, uh, these outcomes is, is exactly what we're seeing here uh, at St. Joe's. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are again seeing uh, a resurgence of, of very ill patients here in our hospital. Uh, they are a younger population, but nonetheless, there, many of them are having poor outcomes. Uh, and unfortunately, a few of them are, are dying of the disease. Uh, and all of those deaths have been avoidable. Uh, all of those deaths have been in, in people who did not uh, get uh, the vaccination against COVID. Next slide, please. 
an important new development uh, in uh, the topic of COVID vaccination uh, is the recommendation regarding uh, COVID vaccination in uh, pregnant patients. Now, uh, up until very recently, um, uh, the advice has been to make an individual decision uh, with your physician about vaccination uh, and um, uh, to consider the vaccination if you're pregnant. However, all of the major professional societies supporting uh, obstetricians, for example, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and now the CDC in lockstep with those organizations is now strongly recommending that pregnant women uh, receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, now, a lot of this information comes from those 346 million people uh, who have already received vaccine doses because uh, we've been able to uh, collect a tremendous amount of information uh, from uh, these patients. Now, uh, 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 a fact that's not commonly uh, discussed, uh, but, but is well known from large population-based studies, uh, is that miscarriage is actually quite common uh, and uh, occurs uh, uh, somewhere between 12 and 15 percent uh, of uh, all pregnancies. Uh, what we know now is that uh, in uh, pregnant women who have received the vaccination, there is no increased risk uh, of complications. There is no increased risk uh, of miscarriage, uh, and there have been no signals whatsoever uh, that the vaccination uh, is harmful uh, to the fetus. What we have seen in pregnant women who are not vaccinated is that they are very susceptible to infection, uh, and they are very susceptible to poor outcomes uh, if they do get the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. Uh, we've seen critically ill women. We've seen uh, many women lose their babies. Uh, we've seen an increased risk of requiring mechanical ventilation uh, in pregnant women uh, and an increased risk of preterm delivery and death uh, for uh, women who are unvaccinated uh, uh, who get COVID-19. So uh, pregnancy is a, a risk factor for poor outcomes for both the mom uh, and the baby, and the vaccines uh, are very, very safe in pregnant patients. And so there is now a very strong recommendation that pregnant women uh, be vaccinated against COVID-19. Next slide, please. So um, uh, we thought we would cover a few vaccine myths uh, to end uh, uh, this part of the presentation and then uh, open it up for your questions. Uh, uh, I see we've got a decent amount of time left, and that's great because we love uh, being able to respond to your questions. Uh, uh, some of the myths uh, uh, that, that have been presented to us, uh, number one, the vaccine was rushed and not tested enough. Uh, that is uh, most certainly a myth, but one that persists. I even had uh, the family member of a, of a patient tell me a couple of weeks ago, didn't I know uh, that the vaccine was only tested in animals. That is a complete falsehood. But unfor unfortunately, misinformation uh, is uh, one of the greatest risks to health uh, uh, in our country right now. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine, for example, was tested in 40,000 individuals uh, in uh, a very extensive controlled study before uh, it was pr uh, approved and was shown uh, to be extremely safe in that large study. The same is true uh, for the Janssen and the Moderna vaccine. Uh, and uh, the extensive experience we now have with having administered millions of doses of the vaccine uh, across the United States has completely confirmed uh, uh, those testing results. People are concerned about side effects of the vaccine. Um, and in fact, very mild side effects are pretty common. Uh, uh, sore arm, uh, some people uh, report uh, muscle or joint pain, uh, few folks have fevers or headache. Uh, those type of things are not uncommon uh, after vaccination. Uh, and they are signs that your body is actually reacting to the vaccine uh, and developing immunity against the virus. 
Uh, however, uh, serious side effects uh, have been extremely rare. Um, and uh, uh, the risk of getting an infection uh, and developing uh, some of these same uh, serious uh, side effects as a result of the infection are much, much greater in people who become infected with COVID-19 uh, than in the uh, extremely small number of people who have had uh, serious side effects after the vaccine. The vaccine could impact fertility. Uh, that is a myth. There's absolutely uh, no evidence whatsoever that the vaccine uh, affects male or female uh, fertility. And in fact, it would be uh, fairly difficult to uh, think of even a mechanism by which the vaccine might impact fertility uh, since uh, it, it is a very, very narrowly targeted vaccine uh, that uh, introduces uh, uh, only one uh, viral element into the body uh, against which the body uh, has an immune response. Uh, I've heard uh, about quite a few people who think they don't need to be vaccinated uh, because they actually had COVID. Uh, this is not true. We are continuing to recommend that everyone receive a vaccine, and that's going to become even more important as we see uh, these new strains of the virus come out. Uh, your immunity against uh, uh, infection uh, wanes, decreases, uh, even if you had the uh, 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 native uh, virus infect you. Uh, and there is uh, data coming out now to suggest that the protection uh, that you get uh, against infection uh, is greater with the vaccine uh, than with uh, a native infection. Uh, so uh, the recommendation is that all of us get vaccines, uh, and uh, there will likely be recommendations that uh, we keep up on our vaccines. In other words, have boosters as time goes on. Uh, we've uh, heard uh, rumors or uh, myths that the vaccine can change your DNA. Uh, that's absolutely untrue. Uh, the mechanism of action of these, vi of these uh, vaccines uh, uh, in no way uh, affects the body's uh, DNA. And in fact, uh, the RNA molecule uh, is unable to physically interact uh, with the body's DNA. It doesn't even enter into the part of the cell that contains uh, the DNA. Uh, and so uh, that, again, is a myth. Um, you know, why people uh, go out of their way to scare people about vaccines is something that is rather mysterious to me. I don't understand it. Uh, but I do understand uh, that for many people uh, in our community and across the country, uh, uh, the lack of understanding of the actual facts uh, about the vaccine uh, is their greatest health risk right now. Misinformation is causing people to die. Uh, the people who are dying in our ICU right now uh, in many instances uh, are dying because of misinformation, are dying because they did not understand uh, how important it was that they get vaccinated. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So uh, we've talked about this from the start. Uh, as a community, uh, we're going to get through this together. Uh, it involves not individual action, but us staying safe together. Delta is is different from previous COVID strains. It's more contagious. Uh, it likely causes more severe disease. Uh, it can break through uh, the vaccine, uh, but uh, uh, the vaccine continues to provide a tremendous amount of protection against severe disease in Delta, even if you do have a breakthrough infection. And very importantly, the Delta virus is a much greater risk to our children uh, and uh, uh, I know that uh, for all of us, uh, protecting our children is of the utmost importance. Vaccination against the COVID virus prevents greater than 90% uh, of severe disease. And as I've already mentioned, despite uh, increased risk uh, of breakthrough with Delta, High vaccination uh, rates will protect our community and lower our rate of disease in the community. And this in turn will allow all of us uh, to go back to school, to go back to commerce, 
uh, and to do so with a, a greater degree of safety. Uh, vaccination is now recommended, highly recommended for pregnant women and for all individuals 12 and older. Uh, but because of the increased risk of infection with Delta, non-pharmacological infection prevention methods continue to be important. And that means uh, that we need to mask when, when we're in public indoor places. Uh, it's still important that we physically distance uh, 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 particularly indoors uh, when possible, uh, and that we use uh, methods to avoid exposure to the virus as well as uh, uh, all of us get a vaccine. Uh, and then I just want to uh, uh, close my sort of prepared comments uh, and talk a little bit uh, about our healthcare workers. Uh, it's 18 months now, uh, and we've been through uh, uh, now multiple surges uh, in vaccine prevalence. Uh, I heard our chief nurse, uh, Ray Charis, uh, talking the other day about her concerns for our nursing staff. Uh, and I share the same concerns for our physicians and our other providers. These folks have worked extremely hard. Uh, they've worked at great risk to themselves uh, and their families. Uh, and uh, while the outpouring of, of love that uh, uh, many of us received earlier on uh, in uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, those outpourings have, have waned so much. And, and, and now uh, it's a grind and we're heading into another surge. And for many people, um, uh, the disappointment heading into another surge uh, is, is uh, uh, multiplied by the fact that we're now caring for people uh, who could have prevented their illness uh, with a simple vaccine. Uh, it can produce uh, stress, fatigue, hopelessness, and it's critically important that we protect our healthcare resources uh, and our healthcare workers uh, as we go through what we certainly all hope will be uh, the last uh, major surge. Uh, in this uh, absolutely terrible uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, that concludes my, my prepared uh, remarks, but uh, I can see that there have been a lot of uh, questions on the, on the, ch on the chat, uh, and uh, we'll have some time uh, to address those questions. I guess I'm turning it back over to uh, Natalie to be our MC here. Actually, I'll, I'll MC the questions to start with, and then Natalie can supplement. Okay, sounds There's good. One question about school children that can't be vaccinated and what can we do? And those are the basic things that Scott finished with. You know, I know wearing masks is hard for children sometimes, but the other things about social distancing, uh, being outside, not being closed spaces, hand washing, teaching them those kinds of skills not only will help prevent some spread of COVID, but will also help prevent spread of flu and colds and other things. The other thing would be to educate parents not to have children come to school if they have symptoms. And unfortunately, symptoms is, you know, a lot of common symptoms for common ailments uh, are similar to the symptoms that we see with patients in early COVID disease as well. And to emphasize the point that uh, Mr. Wiley just made, uh, there is recent data from a, a large study involving uh, over a million school ch children in North Carolina uh, that uh, uh, proved really beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that uh, the practice of children masking while at school vastly reduces the uh, chance for them to become infected. Uh, so if a child does have an infection and doesn't have symptoms, uh, they can still spread the disease. But if they're wearing a mask, uh, that uh, uh, remarkably reduces the, the risk of them spreading that infection to their classmates. So you address the question of uh, booster, and uh, you, I think you address the question of natural immunity versus vaccination. Um, and in both cases, affirmatively, yeah, you should get vaccinated and we're going to get boosters. Um, there's a question about autoimmune. For people who are autoimmune, have autoimmune diseases or are immunosuppressed, uh, how does a vaccine affect them? So uh, that's a great question. First off, uh, having an autoimmune disease uh, 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 is uh, a very powerful incentive to get a vaccination. 
uh, uh, people with uh, immune diseases have uh, less effective responses to infection, and oftentimes they're taking medications uh, that further blunt their response to infection. So it's very important that they get uh, vaccination. Now, um, uh, the problem uh, there with autoimmune diseases is that uh, uh, certain people uh, don't mount uh, as robust of an immune response to the vaccination. Uh, and um, uh, as a result of that, they remain at increased risk for infection. Now, we're likely to hear tomorrow from the CDC that the first group of people uh, for whom a booster is going to be recommended are people who are immunosuppressed, people who have uh, immune problems either because of underlying disease or who have immune problems because they're taking medications uh, to suppress their immune system if they have autoimmune disease uh, or uh, have an organ transplant. So, uh, uh, it's very likely that we'll all be recommended to get boosters, but the first group uh, who are going to be recommended for booster shots uh, are those people who have immunodeficiency states. Thank you, Scott. Here's a, a, another question, and I can answer part of it, but I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. And that is, uh, what percentage uh, is the death rate for patients that are placed on a ventilator? And historically, we've said that's about 50%. If a patient ends up on a ventilator in our ICU, that about uh, mortality is about 50%. Um, but is there any change in that or is it too early to tell with this current surge? Is there any trend towards either lower mortality or longer or shorter lengths of stay on the ventilator? If, um, if a person develops uh, extensive lung disease of such a severity that they require Invasive mechanical ventilation, that means having the breathing tube put through the, through the mouth, through the throat, into the lungs, and then be uh, placed on a ventilator. We haven't really seen a reduction in death rates for those people yet, unfortunately, because that typically indicates uh, that the body's uh, defenses uh, have basically failed uh, and that the person has developed the most severe form of the disease. And those people die well in excess of 50% of the time, regardless of treatment. And we're, we're still seeing that, only now we're seeing it in younger people. Uh, another, another question of, about, uh, there's two questions about the Delta variant. One is, how do we know, how is it uh, determined that it becomes the most prevalent uh, agent for infection. In other words, you know, the CDC now says 90% of all new infections is adult. How do they know that? And then two, um, can people who have, acquired, you know, had a, an infection with a Delta uh, virus uh, get a reinfection? I guess that would just be based on the history of COVID. So yeah. answer that. Well, the first question is actually pretty easy to answer. We define these variants based on their de their uh, sorry, their RNA sequences, uh, their genetic sequences. Uh, and uh, we now have analyzers that can take an, uh, uh, an RNA specimen and sequence it very quickly. So uh, uh, for our patients here at St. Joe's, we send off a certain percentage of those samples to the state lab, uh, and that's occurring all over the state. Uh, and uh, laboratories, state laboratories throughout the United States are, are sampling of virus isolates, uh, and determining, you know, what percentage of these virus isolates are Delta, what percentage are Alpha, what percentage are the Southern California variant. Um, uh, and so it's done by genetic sequencing uh, using automated analyzers that can now do that quite quickly. Now, if a person uh, is infected with the Delta virus and survives, we think that uh, that gives that person a decent amount uh, of immunity against reinfection, but, uh, big but, uh, it's been seen throughout the pandemic uh, that people who have been infected can become reinfected. Uh, and sometimes, particularly in older people and people who have weaker immune systems, those reinfections uh, can be severe and even fatal. Uh, so uh, uh, the conventional thinking uh, is probably true. Uh, infection and survival of an infection probably imparts uh, uh, protection to us, uh, but uh, uh, we don't think it's enough. 
uh, and we still think that uh, everybody should get vaccinated. Thank you. There's uh, several questions here that really relate specific to our employees and the state mandate. And I would I would just tell our employees, number one, we don't know uh, a little bit of that. Um, and uh, Dr. Neely this afternoon is having a meeting with all the chief medical officers in our division to find out the uh, the impact it may have on our medical staff in terms of the mandatory requirement for uh, vaccination. So stay tuned. Uh, we don't know all the answers at this point, and uh, it's a little bit confusing because we have Common Spirit Health directing a communication to 22 states and 140 hospitals, and the state of California has a little different requirement, which can't be covered in that same uh, communication. So, you know, wait for us to communicate to you again. Uh, don't get too excited one way or another by uh, the national communication. Um, Let's see. I don't think we could answer that one. I'm trying to see if there's something else. Natalie, do you see anything else that you? Uh, well, there that... were several, and I think there's some confusion about the FDA approval being an emergency use. Be, and so in some people's minds, I think that means they think it's experimental, not necessarily that it was just um, uh, something that, that was uh, approved. And so, Dr. Neely, can you tell us the difference between, say, FDA emergency use approval versus FDA approval? Um, I'm looking at some of the comments as well. Uh, so uh, FDA approval uh, is a process uh, that has been defined over uh, a many year period of time. Uh, and uh, typically, uh, FDA uh, approval for a new vaccine like this uh, takes years, um, certainly more than a year. And so the emergency use authorization uh, process was developed to allow important, potentially life-saving treatments uh, to, to make it to the population uh, in an expedited fashion. Um, uh, now, um, uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, uh, will likely receive final FDA approval uh, by the first week of September. That process is ongoing right now, uh, and it's expected that uh, somewhere around uh, Labor Day, uh, the Pfizer vaccine is going to receive final FDA approval. Uh, that, that won't change anything except you no longer have to sign a consent uh, recognizing that you're receiving the vaccine under an emergency use authorization. Uh, there was a question about what happens if you uh, are one of the uh, extremely rare people who do have a serious consequence of vaccination. Uh, uh, the process of, of receiving vaccination, uh, uh, whether you're receiving it uh, uh, in an FDA approved manner uh, or whether you're receiving it under an emergency use authorization uh, means you sign a consent stating that you recognize uh, that there are risks and benefits uh, uh, for any medical treatment, including a vaccine, and that you uh, accept those risks. Um, uh, and so, no, you don't uh, have a legal recourse or action uh, that you can take if you were to have a vaccine and, and have uh, one of the very rare uh, uh, severe consequences. And, and I want to emphasize uh, that most of the rare consequences uh, uh, that have been associated with vaccination, uh, for example, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, venous sinus thrombosis, some of you may have read about uh, some of those things, uh, those consequences occur in people who get the infection as well. Uh, and they probably occur more frequently in people who get the infection. Uh, and so that's why it's always difficult uh, uh, to say whether a severe consequence of a vaccine uh, uh, was actually um, even uh, a result of the vaccine, <clears throat> but uh, you're, you're far you're far safer. Get you know we we uh, we have extensive data now that shows uh, you're far safer, probably uh, by a multiple of at least a thousand, uh, in getting a vaccine than uh, taking your chances on getting an infection. I do have several questions or a few questions that were submitted in advance. One is, 
how protected are people with one dose of the vaccine rather than having completed the two if it's a two dose series? People who have received one dose of the vaccine do have some uh, infection, uh, but it is not as strong uh, as uh, for people who have received two doses. If at some point the CDC recommends a booster or a third vaccination and they've already had COVID, would they have too many antibodies and how would it affect them? No, uh, it would not be uh, a situation where you would be concerned about having uh, too many antibodies against COVID. Your antibodies are a natural product uh, that your body makes uh, uh, by the uh, trillions or quintillions uh, on a daily basis. Uh, uh, and uh, they are almost never harmful. Now, autoimmune diseases are a result of our body's immune system attacking us, but uh, that is not a consequence that we see with uh, vaccinations. Okay. But is there a requirement if you've either had a COVID infection or if I have flu-like symptoms, do I need to wait to be vaccinated? Uh, it's recommended that you wait until your symptoms have resolved, uh, but that's the only uh, recommendation regarding waiting times. There's no 30-day or 90-day or six-week or any other uh, recommended waiting time before you get a vaccine. It's simply recommended that you wait until your symptoms have resolved. And then um, I think you may have touched it, but what question that was submitted in advance is, um, do we test for the warrant for the variant here at the hospital? And how many people that are hospitalized are we seeing that have the Delta variant versus say six months ago? Um, we think that about 90% of people who are hospitalized in California have the Delta variant. We are submitting samples to the state lab uh, although we do not yet have a comprehensive uh, uh, report back uh, uh, regarding our own uh, results. Uh, in anecdotally, I can tell you that some of the patients we've cared for who have died recently uh, did have the Delta variant. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, all of the patients who have died in the hospital of COVID since July 1st were unvaccinated. And six months ago, the answer would have been probably zero. Correct. Um, there has been a question in the chat asking about treatments. Unfortunately, we don't yet have effective drug treatments uh, against COVID. Um, we routinely treat people uh, uh, who have not yet developed very severe disease with a drug called remdesivir. Uh, there is weak data to suggest that remdesivir may shorten the duration of illness uh, in patients with COVID, but it does not reduce the risk of dying uh, in patients with COVID. The only drug that's been uh, definitively shown to reduce the risk of dying uh, is dexamethasone or steroids. Uh, that probably works by suppressing the immune response against the virus. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's never uh, uh, a tremendously effective way of treating an infection because you're actually uh, suppressing the patient's immune system at the same time uh, that you're trying to ameliorate uh, the impact of the body uh, uh, of the inflammatory response that's trying to kill the virus. You're, uh, I think of it a little bit like a war going on in your body with a, an invader and uh, and a defense system trying to fight off that invader. And the defense system can cause quite a bit of collateral damage to the lungs, the kidneys, the heart, the brain, so forth, uh, in fighting off that virus. And probably that's the mechanism of the very severe lung disease that occurs uh, in COVID. And so uh, we do give immunosuppressive drugs uh, to patients with severe COVID disease. Uh, and there does seem to be some improvement in outcomes, but it's, uh, it's again, not a terribly effective treatment. Uh, we're hoping that uh, a good antiviral drug uh, will be developed, uh, but uh, uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't seen that yet. I think you've touched on most of the ones we had. And a lot of questions submitted in advance were around the boosters and concerns about boosters and when they'd be eligible for a booster, et cetera. I see a question uh, as to whether we've reviewed the available databases uh, for material adverse events. 
uh, on the VAERS system. Uh, that is where the information is coming from regarding those 346 million doses uh, that have already been administered in this country. And that is a, uh, an incredibly valuable uh, source of information regarding uh, adverse events. And that that's what allows us to say that uh, uh, in all of the uh, cases of adverse events uh, that have been associated with uh, the vaccine, uh, it really amounts to a few cases per million doses uh, administered. Um, and you compare that with the fact that you've got probably about a one in 100 chance uh, of dying if you get the infection. And if you're an older person uh, uh, like me and Mr. Wiley, our chances go up quite a bit. Uh, uh, should we get the infection? So we're we're uh, we're making sure that we get vaccinated. Thank you, Scott. There's a, another question about uh, just uh, outpatient services and whether we require a, a test 72 hours ahead. So for any invasive procedure, any procedure where uh, we're going to give anesthesia. Uh, or do a procedure like that, cath lab, interventional radiology, surgery, we're testing uh, individuals uh, 48 to 72 hours in advance. Uh, we are pretty close to stopping that testing uh, right up until uh, the uh, beginning of July. Uh, and, uh, you know, we didn't do that, but uh, that's because those are procedures that uh, cause aerosoliz aerosolization potentially, not in every case, but potentially, and as a result, uh, maybe uh, exposing healthcare workers to uh, uh, un unknown infections, asymptomatic patients. So we are still doing that. Uh, we we don't require that currently or haven't for a procedure that doesn't like a a laboratory test or a ultrasound or something like that. But obviously, with the state order for visitors to be proving that they've either been vaccinated or have had a test in 72 hours or less, uh, we may look at that as being consistent with that practice. Uh, we're still trying to, uh, we're waiting for the latest, greatest announcement from uh, CDPH, which was supposed to be out two days ago, uh, basically talking about the exceptions to the testing for visitors uh, and family members who are required for the care and who could not have anticipated the admission time. Um, you know, the only way to do that is they, they would have had to have been vaccinated uh, as part of the pregnancy uh, process, which is probably not a bad idea, but, um, you know, they can't know when the baby's going to come exactly and time their test. So in that case, we're, we're probably not going to require uh, testing and vaccination, but we are waiting for the state to clarify that. And the one thing I would just say is please don't get mad at the people here who work at the hospital uh, who, who are being asked to enforce what is amounts to a state public health order about visitation or about testing or about vaccination. You know, we're not trying to take a political position here, but we're required to follow those, those orders. It's not something that we have an option to do. Uh, we, we absolutely have to comply just like we have to comply with staffing ratios and all kinds of other things that, uh, that uh, hospitals and healthcare uh, operations have to comply with. We're a few minutes over. Are there any other uh, burning questions or anything else, Natalie, that you had ahead of time that we should address? Uh, no, but a couple that are somewhat related. If someone received uh, one type of vaccine, can they get another in the future? Or if they only received the first dose, do they start all over to, to get the back full, fully vaccinated? Um, if somebody were going to start again, if they had, for example, had uh, one dose of the Moderna vaccine and they're now months and months out, there aren't any really textbook answers to that, but we know it's very safe. Uh, to receive a different uh, brand or variety of vaccine. Uh, and in fact, there are even some studies in Europe that suggest there might be added benefit uh, to uh, receiving uh, uh, doses of different vaccines. If you were to start all over again with the process, uh, having received Pfizer or Moderna uh, months ago, it would probably be our recommendation that if you're switching, 
uh, that you uh, get both doses uh, of the new vaccine. Um, uh, and uh, you can do that uh, with great confidence uh, in the safety uh, of that practice. And one final one is there's been a couple about breastfeeding. Do, uh, if you're breastfeeding, do they get any protection if the mom's been vaccinated or is there a risk to be vaccinated if you're breastfeeding? That's a, that is a fantastic question. There's no known risk uh, to uh, breastfeeding if you've been vaccinated. Um, we do know that uh, uh, nursing actually does uh, pass uh, uh, immune protection onto the baby, uh, but we don't know uh, whether immune protection against COVID uh, is passed on to the baby by vaccinated mothers. Uh, but it's a very, very good question. I wish, I wish I did know the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And several people have asked this for the recording of this will be available on YouTube and we will send out a link to our employees, but you can always go to YouTube and search for it. Usually takes about a day or two. What will it be titled? It will be titled uh, COVID, Community COVID Update, uh, Delta Variant and Vaccine. And we'll probably have a link to it on our Facebook page, right, Natalie? Absolutely. Okay. Well, we had a, a close to 400 people on at the peak here. Once we got past one o'clock, they they're dropping like flies now. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye to everybody. We really appreciate uh, your interest in in learning more about what the local experience is, and also to learn a little bit more about the science behind the vaccine. Uh, and uh, the immunity that we get from that. So thank you all for being on and uh, we'll hopefully uh, be talking to you about some other subjects soon. Take care. Hopefully, yes.